Hello everyone. This week we're going to be talking about data locations and the meaning of data that are located in certain locations. Uh, for this lecture I'll talk about a few common places or a few places we normally look uh, for information about user activities in, in systems. Um, and then I'll have a couple things you can read that says about other data types and where to look for them and how to investigate them on your own. So, so far we have um, from actually one of our first lectures, a process for asking questions and finding answers to those questions, um, specifically using the scientific method for your investigation. So, um, so far we've acquired suspect or victim data. We've recovered quite a bit of information from the suspect or victim data, and now we need to make sense of it. We actually need to investigate that suspect or victim data and find out what, how does this data relate to the question that's being asked. So the first thing we need to know is what is the question that we're actually trying to ask with this data. Once we've done these investigation, or once we've done all of these forensic processes to get the data exactly the way that the suspect had it, um, what, uh, what are we actually trying to answer here? So are we just looking for um, evidence that uh, the husband killed their wife? Are we looking for evidence that uh, this kid went to uh, a certain phishing website or that their computer was hacked? What are we looking for? So to be able to start the investigation, we need a very good question. What is the investigator trying to answer? Um, we need verified forensic copies of the data. So that was the past lectures. I hope you, you are aware of uh, you know, acquisition and verification of the suspect data. And we need uh, the data to have been processed somehow or recovered. This is our kind of recovery process um, and usually in forensic tools also indexing and doing some other processes to get the data ready to be analyzed. Um, so that's what we have so far. We need to figure out what exactly does this data mean. So now that we have the data, uh, we have to find what it means to our investigation. Um, Imagine that I'm looking at whether uh, the husband could have killed his wife. Um, if the crime is not necessarily a cybercrime, that's a very physical crime, but digital devices might be related to it. So maybe I want to prove that the husband was actually at the house at the time that around the time that the murder took place. Um, I can potentially do that in a few different ways with the, with the data. And the first thing that comes to mind is looking at timestamps on the computer. So does the husband have, for example, his own laptop? And was he logged in? Was he checking Facebook or YouTube or something like that? And what were the timestamps of those activities on his system? So looking at timestamps can potentially place him um, along with the fact that he was logged in on, or someone was logged in on his computer can place him at the crime scene, potentially. So um, some examples of some things that we look at to try to establish user behavior or user actions are timestamps, definitely, uh, Windows registry entries, and also some similar entries in OS X and Linux we'll talk about, um, files in the downloads folder. What do files in the downloads folder actually mean? Uh, files in the temporary internet files. What, what could files in the temporary internet files mean? So I'll talk about those locations and um, what they potentially mean for our investigation just because it's so useful uh, for so many investigations. We'll also I'll have a lot of information about other locations as well. So first off, file timestamps. Um, think about on your computer right now or your phone or whatever digital device you're dealing with, um, what timestamps are created, where are they located, and where is the data stored? So most, or let's say most people are using probably Windows systems. On Windows systems, um, files tend to have, uh, well now two, but usually about three file timestamps. So whenever I create a file or I modify a file or somehow change it, those timestamps are updated. So we usually have creation time, uh, access time, and modified time most common access and modified. But what does that actually mean? What, whenever I'm looking at those timestamps, what can they mean for the investigation? Um, so uh, most file systems on, on any system, a file system itself, will keep track of the timestamp information. So in a Windows system, we most likely have uh, NTFS file system installed. And 
all of the metadata or the timestamp information along with some other information will be stored in the file system. It's not related, I mean, it's not stored in the file itself, it's stored in the file system. Um, again, we usually have modified access and created times. So what do these timestamps mean? It means that some action has taken place at that particular time or around that time. We just have to establish what, act what action was it. So for an example, um, uh, for file creation times, most people would look at a file creation time and say, well, obviously that's the time that the file was created. But is that always true? Can we always say that's true? Not necessarily. If I create a file on my computer, then the creation time would most likely be the time that I created it. But what happens whenever you copy the file onto a USB stick and then move it to another computer and copy it onto that computer? Are the timestamps updated? How are the timestamps updated? And how the timestamps are updated completely depend on the file systems that they're being copied to. So, for example, uh, most USB sticks are probably something like FAT32 um, or EXFAT. And whenever you copy the timestamps over, um, or the, the data over, the timestamps might be updated. And then if you copy it to another computer, the, it might be updated again. So this metadata can change depending on uh, the file system and how people are copying things. So just because we see a created time at a certain time, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was when it was created. It just means that some action has taken place on this system at that time. And we have to find out what exactly that action is. Um, so timestamps can be updated, for example, moving the files around, copying the files, uh, creating the file, editing the file. Um, all of these common actions that we do on files um, can potentially update the timestamps in different ways. So it's the investigator's job to know when are certain timestamps updated for certain file systems. Once we know how the timestamps are updated, then it becomes much easier for us to investigate and, and actually say something about what those timestamps mean. So we'll practice that a little bit this week. Um, so we, we really just need to figure out, whenever we're looking at a timestamp, we know that some action has taken place on that data, most likely on that system, at a particular time. We just have to establish which, which action was it that took place. Uh, so we'll work a lot more with timestamps and especially um, uh, timeline building this week, but uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Next, a very common uh, data source for investigations, especially well, in Windows systems, are uh, Windows registry analysis. The Windows registry is essentially a database of all of the settings and just settings and data f that Windows keeps. So every setting that Windows knows about um, is stored in the Windows registry along with a lot of other information about the user, about the system, about connections that have been made, um, all sorts of information like that. Um, so because it stores all of the settings information, it's a very, very good source for forensic investigators to be able to recover activities that have taken place in the system. Um, the registry contains something we call keys uh, that contain information about the settings, and each key has its own timestamp. Um, and one key that I particularly like to talk about is something called the typed URLs key. So something that looks like typed URLs um, probably, of course, it's a URL, so it most likely relates to browsing behavior, right? And it's specifically called typed URLs. So when we look at that key, um, we want to establish what exactly does it mean if we find data in this key. And whenever we look in there, I have a, 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 an example on my slides here. Um, if we look into that key, we find just websites. So what exactly does it mean whenever we find websites inside that key. Um, and from its name, you might be able to guess, those are websites that are specifically typed in by the user. They are not accessed, it's not internet history or anything like that. Those are the things that are only added whenever a user types it in man manually using a keyboard. Um, they could be inserted other ways. Uh, hackers, for example, could try to insert some things, but um, for the most part, they are specifically typed in by the user. Now, why is that interesting? Well, we have a key that's only created manually by a human. And 
that means that whenever we're doing an investigation, if we want to say that somebody knew about a bad website or they knew they were going to someplace illegal or they knew they were hacking a certain bank or something like that, um, we can establish that they manually typed in the domain name for this bad website or all of these things because a human had to have done it. Now, of course, placing the actual person as the one who typed it is a little bit more difficult, but at least we can say a human must have typed this. It's not going to be automatically added. It's not going to be a robot or something like that. It's going to be a human. Um, so this data source, typed URLs in the Windows registry, um, can start to establish human behavior like a human must have done this. And that's what we're normally trying to figure out. When did the suspect do something or the victim? Um, and how do we know that it was them and not something else, right? So this kind of, this kind of investigation. So typed URLs, we'll look at that a little bit this week. Um, right. The other thing about typed URLs that's, that's somewhat interesting, um, not only the fact that it must have been a human, but also that there is a, um, an order to typed URLs. So um, basically for the first URL, that is the most recently typed URL and we have a timestamp, so we can say that this URL was typed at a certain time. So if the suspect is trying to say, I don't know anything about that website, we can say, were you home at this time? And if they say, yeah, I was home using my computer, but I don't know that website, then we can say, okay, well, this typed URL, this URL was typed at the time that you were home using your computer. So how do you explain that? I'm trying to establish what activities could the user have done and what is their, their story or their alibi? What are they trying to say happened? And what does the computer say happened? That's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we'll talk about typed URLs and analyze a little bit of the registry uh, this week. Um, next is files in the downloads folder. Um, think about for a second what, what you think um, files that you find in a downloads folder mean. Um, of course, most web browsers will default. Any data that they download will download directly to the downloads folder. Um, but does that mean that that's the only way that data gets into the downloads folder? If we find a, an illegal file or a, a virus or any of, this, any of these things in the downloads folder, um, what can that tell us? It can tell us that it probably came from a browser, but um, I might have also copied it from a USB stick or some other place and I just happened to put it in my downloads folder for temporary storage. Um, don't assume that there's only one way to get data into a specific folder like the downloads folder. It can tell us that most likely this file is related to internet browsing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, right? So then we go back to timestamp analysis. When um, would the files have been added to the folder? We can see the, the timestamps of the files when they were created or modified. We can also look at internet history at that point and see was there any, any internet activity at the same time. So now we're looking at multiple data sources to, trying to, to try to figure out, okay, I think these files were downloaded from the internet, but I don't see in any internet history or anything related to these files from any browser installed on the system. Um, but these files are still in the downloads folder. Where could they have come from? Well, now we can go back to the Windows registry and look for uh, inserted USB devices and what time the last USB device was inserted. Maybe that USB device correlates to the same time as the files in the downloads folder, so we can kind of make an argument for, for that. Um, so again, just looking at different data sources and trying to tie everything together. Don't assume that a data source has to come from a certain location, like the internet for the downloads folder. Um, but uh, it also is very likely that it did, right? So uh, we don't assume anything, but uh, the chances are pretty good that downloads are going to be related somehow. Um, the next thing kind of related, files and internet cache uh, or temporary internet files or what's called iNet cache now. Uh, temporary storage for browsers when downloading web pages or web resources. A lot of people don't know that their browsers, um, whenever they're connecting to a website, um, the reason it takes a long time to load is because your computer is actually downloading all of the material to your computer, right? So your browser stores all of that information in temporary internet cache or a cache file, basically. Um, many files are downloaded that the user is usually not aware of. So everything you can see on your screen is downloaded and that's resident on your computer. Um, this is good for investigators as long as it's not cleared out um, because we can potentially see what the user was accessing. 
Um, however, other programs may also use temporary internet files or iMac cache. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a browser, although at most of the times it is a browser. Um, other programs can use it and could potentially download the illegal, the illegal files or legal information that way through a different program than a browser. But because it's in temporary internet files, we might just automatically assume it's a browser. Um, so again, there's a lot, of, a lot of data sources that have a lot of information about user activities that we're normally very interested in. The list is huge and it also depends on the operating system, systems we're looking at. So this week we'll take a look at a few of the data sources for Windows as well as uh, maybe some common data sources for, I, I think I'll do Linux, uh, a, a few Linux systems. So there are many locations for data and there are a lot of different types of data um, that relate to user activities either directly or indirectly. Um, and usually just by making a timeline, we can get an idea of what traces normally relate to user activities. Um, each, each data source or each piece of data can mean something different depending on the context of the case. Um, so I guess the whole point behind this is uh, you have to investigate within the context of the case or within the context of the data around uh, around the data that you're looking for. So, for example, if you find in temporary internet files or files that are downloaded whenever people are just browsing the internet, if you find uh, pictures of knives and bombs and a picture of Seoul, you might assume that the person wants to kill somebody or blow up Seoul or whatever. However, if you look around a little bit more, you might also find out that they were just reading CNN news. And the CNN news articles had pictures of knives and bombs and Seoul or something like that, right? So in one case, it might be somebody planning something horrible. In context, it's actually just somebody who's reading the news like normal, right? So context in investigations is very, very important. Um, and the whole point of this is investigators must know how, uh, when and how data changes based on user and program activities. The more you know how data changes based on some action, the better or the easier it becomes to try to reconstruct all of these events. So if you know all of the different ways that um, uh, temporary internet files could be updated or could be added, uh, you might or you'll have a better chance at finding the truth whenever you're doing your investigation. So that's what we're doing this week is looking at all of these different data sources, trying to extract them and analyze them and see what can they tell us about what we're trying to investigate. So this week we'll have quite a bit of homework about um, just data analysis, data location identification, and pulling out some more information. Thank you.